Well, thank, thank you all for, for coming, and apologies for the delayed start. Technology defeats us all. Um, it's a, a tremendous pleasure, both professionally and, and personally, to be able to introduce the two speakers that, that we have today, um, two very old and, and very good friends, um, Campbell McLaughlin and, and Paul Stephen, um, who I've, I've known and, in addition, to knowing respected enormously um, for, for, it frightens one to say, decades. Um, the topic that they will address from slightly different um, perspectives, different sides of the Atlantic, different sides, I guess, of various oceans, um, is foreign relations law. And it's a topic that both are, I think, uniquely qualified um, to speak about and speak interestingly about. Um, Campbell, uh, who is a professor at um, Victoria University in Wellington, has just published a book titled Foreign Relations Law, which focuses principally on the law of foreign relations in the Commonwealth, this country, England, as well as Australia, New Zealand in particular. And Paul, who's professor of law at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia, is one of the chief reporters of the fourth restatement, the American Law Institute's ALI's restatement of foreign relations law of the United States. And so we'll have two speakers addressing the common law, if one can call it that, of foreign relations law from two of the principal anchors, principal foundations of the common law itself. And I'm sure that that both of them will have um, extraordinarily interesting things to say. Um, by way of advertisement, this is a short commercial break, Campbell's book um, is about to be released, Foreign Relations Law. And Paul's, not exactly book, but work, the fourth restatement, this is the third restatement, the fourth restatement I think will take a little bit longer, probably a little bit longer than Campbell's book, I think. It won't be out this summer perhaps not next summer. But you have to hurry to the online resources through which you can order both of these as, as soon as they're available. Um, I know that one of the things that Campbell and, and Paul will be telling us is something I've been wondering about. What, what is foreign relations law? Um, we have public international law and private law, private international law, and one of the first things we always learn is that those categories don't really make any sense. Um, they've blended into one another and you can't really speak meaningfully about public international law as opposed to private international law. And so they happily come along and will tell us about foreign relations law, which um, no doubt bridges the divide and, and provides um, an answer for how public and private international law um, relate to one another. And more importantly, for those of us in practice here, um, a number of whom I, I see, um, they'll explain why why foreign relations law is of interest, why we all should have come along tonight and, and listened to them. Um, but um, we are, I think, um, privileged and, and on my part at least honored um, to be able, in fact, to listen to them um, explain both the answers to those questions as well as um, the, context, the contents of the books that we'll soon be able to read. Thank you. Campbell. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gary, and really the honor is, uh, is, is, is all mine. Uh, Gary's book, uh, International Civil Litigation in the United States Courts, was one of my earliest inspirations uh, in this field, and it, of course, is now in its fifth edition, uh, such is his amazing industry. Uh, and it's a great uh, honor also to be sitting on this uh, panel with uh, Paul uh, Steve and I, I have uh, the pleasure of being a member of the Institute and therefore have read some of the early, uh, very impressive exposure drafts of sections of the fourth restatement law. And of course, I'm a great admirer of the third uh, restatement prepared by Professor uh, Lou Henkin in 1987. Now, foreign relations law, of course, is a highly developed, indeed hotly contested field in the United States. There are numerous books and articles uh, right across the political spectrum in that country. And there are so many law courses uh, on foreign relations law in the United States that some US colleagues have uh, expressed privately the fear that the, that the teaching of foreign relations law will actually eclipse uh, 
the teaching of public international law itself, rather than serving, as the reporters of the fourth restatement have so rightly reminded us, as a source, uh, uh, being sourced itself from both international law and domestic law. You contrast this, and I say this with some feeling, uh, uh, given ha having chosen uh, this as the title of my forthcoming book, the, uh, the fact that this is an almost unknown and unacknowledged field in uh, British law and Commonwealth law. No book has used this title since F.A. Mann's Foreign Affairs and English Courts in 1986. Uh, the um, editors of Halsbury's Laws of England actually changed from foreign relations law to international relations law in the fifth edition. And yet the essential subject matter, which I define, taking up Gary's uh, baton, as the law governing the external exercise of the public power of the state within the domestic polity has never been more pressing, has it? Uh, both uh, in uh, considerations at the executive level where the fundamental basis for foreign affairs and defence powers have recently been re-evaluated in this country through government papers, in Parliament, where new powers in relation to treaty ratification have been acquired and powers to review executive action have been increasingly exercised. And of course, in the courts, where the effect of the external exercise of the public power of the state upon individual claimants is being increasingly challenged. So at this somewhat existential moment in the long history of this great country, where the endurance of its two most important constitutional treaties seem increasingly up for debate. I speak, of course, of the Treaty of Union of 1707 and the Treaty of Rome on European Union, encouraging a tendency perhaps to look excessively inwards. I want to take a moment to look, encourage us to look outwards at the law governing external relations, because what I want to suggest is that what's been going on in this field is no less important a revolution, if you like, in foreign relations law here, and that there is a new model of British and Commonwealth foreign relations law emerging, which is important because it's different in material respects to the American model, and might provide useful in insights to other states, given the deep commitment to the multilateral system and the shared Westminster model of democratic government under the rule of law which uh, those states share. But that what we really need is a new structure and language for talking about foreign relations law because the doctrines of the past are really very often just lawyers' reasons for non-law and are not suitable for current problems. So I just want to do five short things in my brief remarks to you this evening. Firstly, to try and answer the question why American and British foreign relations law have pursued such different paths. Secondly, to answer how previous doctrines of English law have served to exclude foreign relations from legal purview. Thirdly, to address what's caused then the rise in the prominence of foreign relations law issues in recent decades here. Fourthly, to discuss what's really at issue in foreign relations law cases, and then to suggest when and why a new approach to analyzing these problems might matter. So turning first to the transatlantic divide. This is surprising, isn't it? Because we have, in the common law, a distinctly shared inheritance. More specifically, in the foreign relations law field, we both start from the concept uh, first espoused by John Locke uh, of the federative function in foreign affairs, uh, which, in which he advocated and he still gives the best early modern justification for the centralization of the foreign affairs function in the executive. But we also both inherited uh, the perhaps rather more subversive notion, not generally recognized as such, uh, embraced by Blackstone and Mansfield, the notion that international law is part of the law of the land, which, as I argue, gives the judiciary a distinct function in foreign relations as well. And after all, the US Constitution was, as Professor Stephen has reminded us, born out of the foreign relations imperatives of the Treaty of Paris, 1783, the peace treaty between the United States and Great Britain. And it's striking that the extent to which the fourth restatement of foreign relations law in the United States still draws upon case law uh, of the US Supreme Court from that early period. 
Uh, the shared inheritance, after all, isn't just a question of hist historical uh, curiosity. After all, the application of the writ of habeas corpus to those under the control, in fact, of officers of the state outside uh, state territory has recently been considered, illuminatingly considered, as part of a shared inheritance both by the US Supreme Court uh, and by the Supreme Court here in the United Kingdom. But there were, after all, weren't there, some very deliberate decisions taken by the framers of the United States uh, Constitution, which served to take and to rebase US foreign relations law on a rather different plane, not least uh, the provisions that treaties are part of the supreme law of the land uh, and the unique uh, role of the Senate uh, in approval of treaties under the US Constitution. In Britain, there was no such constitutional moment. Indeed, it's remarkable the extent to which the prerogative as a source of the foreign relations power, the prime source, has persisted despite its transformation in character from its earlier uh, guise as being a royal prerogative uh, to its ministerial exercise in the contemporary constitution. Nor was there any such constitutional moment uh, for that matter in Canada, Australia or New Zealand, although the Australian constitution does anticipate, perhaps to a greater extent than is the case in those other countries, uh, the implications of a division of powers for foreign affairs. The division between the United States and the United Kingdom and, Co and the Commonwealth on foreign relations law has persisted despite our uh, many ties and our shared common law inheritance. One can think, of course, of the battles of the 70s and 80s over the scope of extraterritorial jurisdiction. But of course, in more recent times, since September the 11th, what Professor Kent Roach has called uh, claims of substitute justice, where relief not available in the United States courts for claimants at Guantanamo Bay and elsewhere have been sought in Commonwealth courts, have resulted in some cases in some rather serious diplomatic démarche at the intergovernmental level. It's still therefore necessary for me to explain what are the key features of legal thought that led to the suppression of the idea of a British foreign relations law. So my, that's my second point, what are these exclusionary doctrines? Well, the first is the simple idea that public law stops at the border, or in the uh, uh, wonderful words of a prominent uh, uh, current text on administrative law in this country, foreign parts are beyond the pale in Kipling's words without the law, and there the Crown has a free hand whether the plaintiff be foreign or British. The second is a notion about the limitation in Parliament's role being limited to the municipal sphere. The notion that the making of a treaty is an executive act producing no effects within the domestic law, which only Parliament can do by legislation. The third, a very strict idea about territoriality of jurisdiction in public law. Fourth element of the exclusionary doctrines, the exclusion or large, uh, very large exclusion of foreign relations from judicial scrutiny. What right have I, asked Lord Eldon in, uh, in 1823, to interfere upon the subject of a contract with a country uh, uh, with, which, which the king does not recognize. A question he might well have asked since he sat both on the bench and in the cabinet uh, at the time. Uh, leading, of course, to the one voice principle uh, so often uh, referred to in the case law, the notion that the state cannot speak with two voices. And finally, uh, the exclusion of the conduct of foreign states from domestic purview. After all, this country hung on to the absolute uh, doctrine of sovereign immunity uh, for rather longer than other states did, and also to a rather broad notion of the non-enforcement of foreign penal revenue and public laws, and uh, to the foreign act of state doctrine. So if that's what caused, uh, if those were the ideas which caused the exclusion of foreign affairs uh, uh, from uh, law in uh, English law and the Commonwealth, what are the factors that have uh, prompted a reappraisal. Well, I think the first point is the domestic impact across a much broader canvas than simply foreign relations issues of public international law within the domestic polity. Because 
in the search for dem democratic accountability across the international domestic divide, the notion that Parliament ought to have an increased role in treaty ratification uh, has simply uh, become uh, uh, an argument that has to be recognized. Second element, I think, is a much um, broader, or pr perhaps I should say messier, uh, because large scale and diverse, external deployment of public officials. Once you have officers of the state stepping outside state boundaries in all sorts of different roles, uh, you have uh, many more issues to resolve. The third element is simply extended public law regulation, uh, a move from the formalistic approach of the past with its no rigid notions of territorial jurisdiction uh, to a much more substantive uh, connection test. Uh, fourthly, the protection of the individual vis-a-vis -vis the state. Now this is often in this country, certainly if you read the newspapers, uh, traced to the in, uh, domestic incorporation of uh, human rights legislation. But in fact, it significantly predates that. After all, all four of the states which I have considered in my study uh, adopted uh, at a much earlier stage a general principle of Crown civil liability. And although in this country the cases that have hit the headlines in relation to the external application of the European uh, Convention on Human Rights are ones that have come out of the European Court of Human Rights, the, the issues raised in relation to protection of individuals from external exercise of state power are not uh, Euro-exclusive. One can read, for example, the judgments of the Supreme Court of Canada uh, dealing with the case of uh, Mr. Carter uh, in Guantanamo Bay to see that exactly the same kinds of issues have arisen in relation to the Canadian Charter. And indeed, I would go further and say that uh, the question of the extent of the judicial function in protecting individuals uh, where uh, state power uh, exceeds uh, proper boundaries is not limited to the human rights uh, context. Because after all, as Mr. Justice Leggett observed uh, very recently, determining whether an individual has been unlawfully deprived of their liberty is quintessentially a matter for the court. So one has, for example, judgments of the Australian courts where there is no human rights legislation, at least at federal level, which work from that premise uh, and achieve a very similar result. And the fifth factor, I think, that's driven an increased profile of foreign relations law on this side of the Atlantic has been what I would call the normalization of the position of the foreign state. The introduction of the restrictive doctrine of state immunity on the one side, but also the increased admissibility of foreign state claims where the foreign state is the, is the claimant or plaintiff in, in situations as diverse as the protection of foreign states' uh, cultural heritage and the disgorgement of the proceeds of insider trading. And the increased recognition that the foreign act of state doctrine can't be taken at face value uh, in the context of the many different ways uh, in which uh, it's necessary for the courts to evaluate the conduct of foreign states. So then, in conclusion, if the old doctrines have lost some of their explanatory power because in providing a set of lawyers' reasons for non-law, as I earlier suggested to you, for the blanket exclusion, if you like, of foreign affairs from the domestic legal sphere, they no longer adequately explain the actual work that domestic law is expected to do and the different issues and interests that have been involved, involved in, in different cases. And here I very much agree with an article Professor Stephen uh, wrote in 2010, where he said, uh, in a world where the contribution of international law to social ordering is widespread, instrumental concerns re replace existential anxiety. We need a much more fine-grained analysis of these problems. When you do that in the field of foreign relations law, what you discover in my submission is a set of principles which perform essentially what I've called an allocative function. In other words, they serve to allocate competence and applicable law between the three organs of government within the domestic polity, between sovereign states, very much a function of our modern restrictive doctrine of state immunity, and, where necessary, between the national and international legal systems. 
Well, on its own, uh, giving uh, that label doesn't tell you who has competence and what law applies to any given problem. It simply leaves open the hard normative questions, and for that, you'll have to read the 700 pages of my book. Um, but I'm happy to talk about individual problems in discussion with you. It is important, though, to emphasize that I'm not saying that all foreign affairs issues are necessarily subject to the domestic municipal courts of the forum. Quite the contrary, when it is, it's not the uh, proper function of any foreign relations uh, law uh, to subject for, for any, the courts of any one country to have to become uh, what uh, was called in one case uh, a global policeman. And that's because they might well fall within the proper purview of one of the other organs of government or the relevant foreign state, or as in a case uh, such as the decision of the uh, UK House of Lords in Gentle, uh, dealing with the legality of a decision to engage in armed conflict, within the purview of the international legal system itself and outside uh, the function of a domestic uh, court. But the notion of an allocative function does and should, in my submission, make us think again about the true scope of the application of doctrines such as the Act of State Doctrine to the extent that it's said that they exclude certain matters entirely from legal purview as involving what would be called, I think, in the United States, a political question. Hirsch Lauterpacht wrote in 1933, every international dispute is of a political character if by that is meant that it's of importance to the state in question. Thus viewed, the proposition that some legal questions are political is an understatement of what's believed to be the true position. The state is, after all, a political institution and all questions which affect it as a whole, in particular in its relations with other states, are political. But it's equally easy to show, he suggested, that all international disputes are, irrespective of their gravity, disputes of a legal character. In the sense that, so long as the rule of law is recognized, they're capable of an answer by the application of legal rules. Well, in these no less uncertain times, it's vitally important for us to reassert the importance of the view, which I take to be fundamental to any state governed by the rule of law, that the state strengthens rather than weakens its essential functions in the field of foreign relations by subjecting them to law. Thank you very much. So two quick thank yous. First to the law firm of Wilmer Hill and my youthful but long-term friend, uh, Gary Bourne, uh, for uh, the wonderful generosity has been shown to me. I've spent six weeks here, more or less, as a uh, scholar in residence, uh, a spectacular opportunity. Uh, I'm still overwhelmed. And uh, for Gary's friendship and uh, attention, I'm, I'm very grateful. And Professor McLaughlin, uh, whose work I have long admired, and I finally had a chance to meet him. He's coming to Charlottesville in the fall, where he sees the one place on earth that might compete with New Zealand for uh, beauty and, and glory. Uh, thank you for the uh, very interesting remarks and, and your work in this area. Uh, my, I have two goals uh, in the brief time I have to speak. One is to address a little bit uh, American exceptionalism or, or, or try to just toss out some ideas as to why the American uh, thinking about foreign relations law is different from what we see in the Commonwealth. And secondly, to relate in particular the experience of the American Law Institute, since that's my baby at the moment, and, and try and tie this together by addressing the issue that Professor McLaughlin uh, touched on, which is, is foreign relations law a threat to international law? Uh, not surprisingly, I'm going to argue it's not, uh, but I think the answer is complicated, and uh, I'll, I'll try and be lucid while appreciating the complication of that problem at the same time. Now, first of all, American exceptionalism. I, a part of it is in the founding and in the writing of the document, uh, but something that was not written down in the document I think became important very early, which is the concept of judicial review. Uh, the idea that the courts, all courts, state and federal alike, uh, 
have the authority and indeed the duty to apply the Constitution to review the acts both of legislatures and officials. Uh, further extended by the power that has been developed by our courts over the years to uh, create an unwritten constitution. Uh, uh, that is to say, to infer and interpret and maybe even invent uh, uh, interests, values, and rights and duties in our constitution that can't, I think, easily be traced back to the text. Uh, more importantly, the competence, competence of our uh, U.S. courts to engage in this function, I think, has had uh, an enormous function on Amer uh, an, an, sorry, an enormous impact on American law generally, and I think it has had uh, is part of the explanation for why American foreign relations law is different. That is to say, many of the important foreign relations questions that we encounter come to us as domestic law, particularly constitutional law questions in which the international law implications are background rather than front and center. Uh, although there is a tradition of American courts deciding domestic constitutional questions by looking at the Constitution, uh, the, the leading American case in the 19th century on jurisdiction, uh, adjudicative jurisdiction, is uh, based entirely on, on the court's understanding of public international law. Uh, uh, but this mixture of the power of the courts in exercising uh, judicial review leads to a tension. Uh, that is to say, on the one hand, we treasure this authority. On the other hand, uh, we realize that it is to some extent contingent, uh, that the robustness and creativity of the courts in developing this power produces its own challenges, its own resistance. So we also have a sense of judicial power as const constantly under threat. And as a result, there is a ongoing process of balancing and rebalancing. Uh, how does this affect uh, foreign relations law? Uh, well, I think the development of foreign relations law as articulated in the several restatements gives us at least some sense of this process. Uh, as no one needs to know. Uh, the numbering of restatements has nothing to do with uh, sequence of restatements as such. That is to say, the first restatement of foreign relations law was the second restatement. That's because the rule of naming in the American Law Institute is once we've started on a second restatement, they're all second restatements until there comes a third restatement and then so on. Uh, so the very first restatement, which is the second restatement, uh, published in 1965, uh, it was a very interesting snapshot of the problem of, of foreign relations law seen before what I would call the crisis in American foreign relations. The uh, this collapse of the American effort in Vietnam, the scandals leading to the removal of President Nixon, the general crisis in the society that uh, I think ran through the 1970s. Uh, all this was yet to come, and as a result, the view of foreign relations law in 1965 was very much, here is international law, which we American lawyers have quite a deal of confidence and um, comfort in restating for the world, and this is how international law enters the U.S. legal system. Uh, but very little focus on what Professor uh, McLaughlin calls the allocative function. Uh, just the assumption is international law comes in somehow, and how it comes in is not a terribly interesting question. Uh, the third restatement, uh, begun in the late 1970s, published in 1986, I have argued, and therefore believed to be true, uh, uh, very much reflects the crisis of the 1970s. Uh, I have argued, if you compare Professor uh, Hankin's wonderful treatise, uh, published in 1972 with the early drafts of the restate, third restatement, uh, in 1980 in particular, something important has changed. His views have changed. And they've changed in the direction of a loss of faith in the political branches of the executive and the legislature and a desire to bring in the courts as the only institution left worth trusting in the United States. Uh, there were probably some specific politics to this. I think after 
the end of 1980, there was particular concern among uh, Professor Henkin and his co-reporters, uh, all of whom had been in Washington but were no longer men of Washington at that time, about the new people in Washington, uh, the Reagan administration. And one of the ways of safeguarding uh, what they saw as the advances of the Carter administration, the first important steps out of the quagmire, out of the crisis of the 70s, was to embed those accomplishments in uh, rules that could be judicially enforced and therefore uh, protected from interference by the president and the legislature, which they had come after 1980 to deeply distrust. I don't want to overstate this claim. They also were very good technical lawyers, and, and, and I, I don't want to exaggerate this influence, but I think this is a leitmotif, if nothing else, in, in the third restatement. Um, so many things happen in the third restatement, and I can't capture all of them here. I, I just want to emphasize uh, two moves that are particularly relevant to the allocative function. One is a general strong presumption that if it's in a treaty, it's covered by the supremacy clause and therefore judicially enforceable. Uh, Non-self-executing treaties seen as exceptional and rare, uh, which meant the treaties could be used as yet another uh, tool in the toolbox of, of the judge. And an even stronger claim, which was that um, international law was federal law, uh, and that it came into US law as part of the federal common law powers of our courts that survived uh, Erie versus Tompkins. Uh, the second move in particular, I think, uh, touched on a move that the authors of the restatement made that I'm not sure what, I, I'm sure was not meant to uh, confuse or evade. Uh, I think there was a deep sense that this distinction between public and private international law was arbitrary and that each had a lot to teach the other. And uh, there was an effort to bring into public international law principles that were really rested in private international law. I think the best example would be uh, section 403 of the third restatement, the one that argued that as a matter of public international law, unreasonable exertion of jurisdiction was a internationally wrongful act, as opposed to simply not a good idea. Uh, this was not only controversial in the United States, but I think to the surprise of the reporters, it produced a certain amount of international pushback. Uh, uh, people asking, where is the authority for this? So for a rule that, as you articulate, it seems to apply to us, not just to the United States. Um, so that brings us to the fourth restatement. Uh, on the one hand, uh, much in the third restatement is treasured, particularly uh, by uh, discrete communities within international law. I think both the investment lawyers and the human rights lawyers liked a lot of what they saw in the third restatement and are nervous about any changes that might undermine uh, that. On the other hand, uh, there was an important thing that was happening just in the United States jurisprudence just as the third restatement came out, which was that the Supreme Court uh, at about that time, uh, really in the early 80s, was pushing back against the idea that there were extra constitutional sources of judicial power to create and enforce rights. Uh, there was no cutting back, uh, there was a change in the composition of constitutional rights, but there was no cutting back on the constitutional power. But there was growing skepticism about certain moves, implied rights of action, uh, and the like, uh, that essentially increased the non-constitutional tools that federal and state courts could use. Um, to resolve cases. And the move of the third restatement to bring international law in as a generally adjudicable uh, right was really contrary to that move. And when restatement meets Supreme Court, Supreme Court usually wins. Uh, so that by uh, 2011, when Lance Liebman came to me, the director of the American Law Institute came to me and asked, this, uh, form a group to start considering a uh, fourth restatement. Uh, it was clear that things had changed in the United States, and the changes were not crazy, it seems to me. I mean, exactly because our 
uh, courts uh, through the judicial review function wield such uh, considerable power uh, that some caution about creativity and, and some uh, willingness to, uh, rather than go ahead to say to Congress, uh, for example, a theme that's really become manifest in the Roberts Court, uh, uh, we want to hear from you first before we get into this area. You tell us to go in, we go in, including a number of foreign relations uh, areas, uh, the Bond case uh, this spring being one example, uh, the uh, Kiabel case, of course, being a, a famous example, where the court says not that we're unwilling to do this, but we're unwilling to do this on our own nickel, uh, that we want Congress to provide uh, some backup for us, some instruction uh, before we move into this area. Um, this to me is not inevitable, but it is at least not crazy. Uh, so what the fourth restatement is trying to do, we're not sure, of course. It's a long-term process. Gary was talking about not next summer. Uh, what we actually do is produce pieces as we can. One of the things we've decided to do with this iteration that was not done in the second and third restatement is to do modules. Uh, so that we are now doing separate works on jurisdiction, the immunity of the state, uh, and treaties. Uh, we anticipate adding modules, uh, but quite honestly, we're trying to earn the trust of the various constituencies and audiences uh, before we go too far ahead. We want to move, proceed cautiously, uh, and this modular approach necessarily slows us down. Uh, if we add uh, Further modules, and indeed if we go past the general part, what was part one of the third restatement, and add special subjects, uh, that will slow us down even further. Um, I'm looking at 10 years, uh, 10 to 15 years, I think, before we have a book like that blue book that Gary just waved, uh, which means that in the meantime, there'll be plenty of tentative drafts that will be publicly available. There's one now on recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments. Uh, but we see this as a long-term process uh, in which we try and reflect the increasingly complex world of foreign relations law. It won't be as interesting as the third restatement, which I think had a certain clarity and consistency to it. Uh, I think we are bringing the unhappy message of messiness and confusion, although we hope we shed at least a little bit of light, but we're trying not to blink away the problems and try and uh, uh, create a veneer of simplicity over what we see as very hard problems. Thank you. And I would like, if I if I could, to thank thank again both both Campbell and and Paul for um, extremely provocative and and interesting presentations. My job at, at this point is to continue talking until um, various members of the audience um, ask questions, um, which may entail some degree of creativity. It strikes me, though, um, as you all are thinking about your questions, um, that on some level the, the Commonwealth and the United States are, are moving in, in different directions, at least according to, to the accounts of, of our two speakers. Paul. Um, I think spoke um, um, quite vividly about um, hesitations with regard to the um, judicial enforcement of either international or internationally derived rights in U.S. courts. Um, a third restatement that put that enforcement um, together with a fairly um, confident um, assertion of what those international rights were front and center um, that investors, human rights claimants, others all could seek protections under the rule of law in U.S. courts and that since then, since 1986, the world at least from a U.S. perspective has become somewhat more complicated, somewhat more messy, somewhat less interesting and that their hesitations about the ability to enforce rights, be they rights of foreign investors or rights of individuals seeking protection of their civil, their, their human rights. At the same time, if I understood correctly, Campbell described 
a somewhat opposite um, dynamic uh, momentum in the Commonwealth, where a world um, best characterized by Kipling as Alsatia or beyond the pale, beyond the rule of law, um, and with perhaps less of a tradition of judicial review, was moving in the opposite direction, moving in the direction of more enforceable international rights in, in domestic and in, in Commonwealth courts, whether it be Guantanamo Bay issues in Canada or European Convention on, on Human Rights issues elsewhere. Um, and I guess what occurs to me as I, I, I listen to those two accounts is, is this um, a happy arrival at a, a medium somewhere in between, a happy medium in between, or is it alternatively two ships passing in the night and ending up more or less where the other had started from? <laughs> um, is it um, the Commonwealth trading places with the 1986 view of, of um, at least some American scholars, um, or is it um, everybody coming to a happy medium, rather like what the drafters of Section 403 hoped they had accomplished? And um, perhaps that's an issue, while others are thinking of their questions, that um, Campbell and then Ben Paul might, might turn their minds to. Well, I don't think the ships are passing in the night. Uh, I think the, in, the allocative function implies certain competencies, and I don't think the company's competencies are going to be identical. Uh, you know, we don't have a Westminster system. We have much more tension between our parliament and the president than uh, England has, certainly. Uh, the, uh, uh, this judicial review power, to repeat myself, I think is, is enormous and, as far as I know, unique. Uh, at least for a court of general jurisdiction. Uh, so we'll never look exactly alike, but you know, it, it's a world that is increasingly uh, drives us with common problems, and uh, maybe the legal formulations will look different. Uh, the American Guantanamo cases were all based strictly on the Constitution. They weren't international law cases, although international law was there in the background. Uh, but you know, maybe the courts didn't go far enough, but you know, there was certainly, uh, you know, not simply reinterpretation, but striking down of legislation that were, was thought to be uh, inadequately protective of the rights of the people uh, uh, jailed in Guantanamo, imprisoned in Guantanamo. Uh, so, I, I, I think we, the issue really is one of interpretation. Uh, different languages to say something that often is quite the same thing. I mean, I think, I think my own view is, well, firstly, it's why we're both grateful to you for hosting the seminar. I think there's, there's uh, uh, much more scope for interchange on these issues than, than perhaps there has been in the past. Um, equally, I don't want to suggest that this is some kind of unstoppable, unstoppable roller coaster as far as uh, uh, English and Commonwealth law is, con is concerned. Um, it's plainly not, because for every decision that you can point to which shows an increased degree of uh, judicial activism, you can also point to other decisions which uh, have very much maintained uh, a more um, uh, traditional view. Um, but what I do say, and I completely agree with, with, with Paul, that you know, the starting point in each case is uh, the, what are the fundamental structures of your municipal constitution, because everything that is done has to be filtered through that, or seen through that prism. But what I do say is I, I don't think it's any longer enough just to say, well, we have separation of powers and this whole issue is just put in the executive box and then we don't ask any more questions about it. Um, because separation of powers was never about separ separate boxes. Se separation of powers is all about a distribution of powers so as to enable each holder of power to be kept in check by the other. And let's not forget about the role of parliament here, uh, where, in fact, uh, that's another equally significant uh, growth area, if you like, in, uh, in Commonwealth uh, constitutions has been the increased role of Parliament both in treaty review and also um, in uh, supervision of the, of the executive. Bob? Uh, <clears throat> and, and perhaps when the, the questioners from the audience um, ask a question, they can identify themselves first. There should be a mic coming around as well. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, I'm Robert Sloan from Boston University Law School, and uh, I have the great privilege of being here as a scholar in residence for six weeks. Um, my question has to do with uh, the role of the judiciary um, for both Paul and Campbell. Um, there is a stress, it seems to me, on judicial review uh, and the courts. And to my mind, uh, the courts play a very reactive role in foreign relations law. Uh, I'm, of course, only familiar really with the United States, but uh, if you look at um, judicial decisions in the United States, the courts are very tentative. What they tend to do is to say uh, no standing, political question doctrine, or if they're going to answer a question about international law, they defer to the executive, or they say um, until international law, customary international law in particular, is um, uh, clear enough, we don't want to answer yet. And that's a kind of common theme. So if you go to Sabatino or if you go to Sosa, on and on, the Supreme Court seems to be saying, you know, give us law that we can process, right? Give us clear law, and we're willing to adjudicate international law. But otherwise, it's really for the political branches. And this um, dovetails with uh, a kind of more general point, which is that a lot of foreign relations law strikes me as made by, not the courts, but primarily by the President and Congress in the United States, at least. Uh, by practice, by tradition, and so forth. And then the courts play this backup role of kind of affirming or modifying at the, at the margins. Now, um, I know this is a long question, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, but Campbell, uh, and I guess my, uh, my question for you is, um, to what extent that is true in uh, other Commonwealth jurisdictions? Uh, we have, as you've both emphasized, a constitution which frames uh, for the United States to some extent, foreign relations law. And I, I'm curious to know um, the extent to which the courts play some kind of a more active role in other Commonwealth countries. Thank well, you. Well, thank, thank you for the question and the very perceptive uh, comments, if I may say so. I mean, to some extent that's true of the judicial function generally, isn't it? That it's always reactive and to some extent pathological. Something has to have gone wrong sufficiently, at least in the mind of the plaintiff. Uh, for uh, an application to be made, and it's always going to be after the event, or normally. Um, and of course, the prime role for the actual formulation and driving forward of foreign policy inevitably has to be the, the function of the executive. Uh, and uh, Parliament's role, as I've just said, equally important. The, I, I think I, I thought about this a lot when I was trying to write my section on, on the role of the judiciary. Uh, for me, at any rate, um, it seemed to me that most of the cases could be explained rather clearly in a distinction, whether or not it was fully articulated in the mind of the judges, between cases where the judges decided not to intervene because what was really raised was, in essence, a policy question, which it just wasn't part of the judicial function to determine. On the one hand, and cases where actions of the executive had actually invaded what would otherwise, were it not for some doctrine, like the Act of State Doctrine or whatever, uh, be a, a perfectly valid right or freedom of the claimant. So the traditional function of the courts in protecting the individual against the state, it, it seems to me, is a function which is properly within the judicial uh, sphere, even if that's not always so clearly articulated in um, Commonwealth constitutions. Although, for example, and that's why I made the, mentioned the Australian constitution, we're fortunate to have in the audience a former Solicitor General of Australia, um, it, that uh, there it's the written constitution's definition of the idea of a judicial function which has led the, the federal courts to uh, be able to uh, articulate uh, a role for the courts, a distinct role for the courts in protecting individual uh, rights. Nothing to add. Um, sometimes in law school classes, they ah, Maurice. Maurice Mendelssohn. Um, apart from the factors which Campbell has mentioned in his very interesting talk, I just wanted to mention three factors which seem to me to have been influential in the 
some in the limited extent to which English judges at any rate have um, changed their attitude to international law. One of them is globalization. There's a lot of pressure of events on the in, on English law. There are a lot of in foreign investors, all sorts of things going on. And one can't simply ignore them. One has to react. Um, secondly, and to some extent connected with that, is the availability of legal aid. You have a lot of cases, I mean, even these days when the government seems to be trying to abolish it, you have a lot of legal aid cases brought by, for example, refugees who are relying on the refugee convention. They couldn't have done it before there was legal aid. They couldn't have afforded the lawyers. Immigration cases, likewise, all sorts of human rights cases where, um, apart from the fact that the European Convention has been domestically incorporated, there are people who are able to raise these issues. And I think that's a factor in all sorts of ways which shouldn't be neglected. And the third thing is, that, is education. I think there's been a considerable change of attitude in our judiciary to international law and indeed foreign law. I, when I started in this business, I remember judges making speeches to people like us saying, oh, English law is law and foreign law is fact and international law is fiction. Ha, ha, ha. Um, <laughs> and you don't get that so much anymore, not at all. There are a lot of judges who probably, first of all, they'd have a proper education and that has at university, not at the Inns of Court, and that has included public international law. And secondly, for all sorts of reasons, they have experience, they're more open to international law and foreign law. And I think I certainly have noticed a profound change in the general, they may just be politer, but <laughs> I think I've noticed a profound change in their attitude to these things. I think that was a question for Paul Stephen. <laughs> um, and the question is, how, what sort of attitudes have you seen, both in the US Supreme Court and otherwise, with respect to, on the one hand, foreign law, and on the other hand, international law. Is it um, fact and fiction or something else? Um, I think the current court is quite unusual in American history. There's not a single person on the court that's held elective office. Uh, I don't think anyone has held any public office outside of appellate litigation. Uh, and, and as a result, we don't have what we've often had on the court, which is a former Secretary of State serving as Chief Justice, as John Marshall was, as Charles Evan Hughes was. Um, so so I, I, I think that the, you have to take that into account, that it is the narrow practicing lawyers uh, in, un, affected by state responsibilities, high state responsibilities, that mm -hmm. I think is shaping our current uh, court. Now, having said that, I, I, I think that it, you have to say for what purpose. And let me use as an example uh, my predecessor as professor of comparative law at the University of Virginia, uh, a much uh, uh, criticized uh, uh, figure on the current court, the oldest member of the court, most senior at least, I don't know if he's the oldest, who was Justice Scalia who um, is a serious comparativist and takes international law quite seriously, I think more seriously than many of his colleagues, but also feels quite strongly in a kind of categorical way of seeing the world that none of this should infect things that are purely domestic. So he is both quite uh, opposed to the use of foreign and international sources as means of constitutional interpretation on the theory that that's a domestic compact um, it also fits in with his originalism. Uh, what are norms today doesn't interest him. He's interested in what was the norms at the time that these particular instruments were enacted. And yet you give him a treaty, treaty case or a private international law case, and I think he's pretty good, uh, better than most of his colleagues. Uh, I wouldn't say that about all the justices, certainly, but I, I think that, uh, again, I'm just trying to complicate things. They're not no-nothings. Um, although they don't have the political noose that many of their predecessors did, you know, uh, a Black or a Harlan and then a Warren certainly oh. did. Well, while the audience is thinking for the next, uh, the next question, I had, I had one that had occurred to me as, as both Paul and, and Campbell discussed the allocative function. And, and that, that question is as, as follows. Um, where in the law of foreign relations 
uh, and its allocation does international arbitration, and in particular, international investment arbitration fit. If part of the law of foreign relations is to allocate to particular um, parts of um, individual states um, international legal issues and the protection of rights of investors or individuals, where does investor state arbitration fit in that allocation? Because as we all know, Campbell, as, as well as anyone, just finishing a day sitting on an investor state tribunal, um, uh, bilateral investment treaties, the exit convention, have played an increasingly important part in the public international law order. And I think, I think my question is, how exactly does the law of foreign relations deal with that development? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I would say is that I think that using what I call these allocative techniques is a very good way of unbundling otherwise the puzzle of so much of investment arbitration, because it is, after all, a mixed, designedly a mixed system. It's a designedly a system in which both public international law and municipal law, typically that of the host state, both have a role to play. But unless you do what Paul Stephen, in a different context, has encouraged us to do, which is drill down and do a bit more of a fine-grained analysis, you're not going to get much, get very far by just saying, "Oh, we'll both apply." You've got to work out to which issues uh, do we apply international law and to which issues do we apply um, um, host state law. But this, in essence, nevertheless, as, an, as a system of dispute settlement, what investment arbitration illustrates is part of that broader point which I made, which is that, of course, a modern foreign relations law isn't just choosing between the competencies of two uh, domestic states, because there is, in addition, um, the international plane. I know Professor Crawford has quite rightly said there's no such place as the plane of international law, um, but nevertheless, as a, as a legal matter, there is. Uh, and uh, what systems uh, like that of the Exit Convention do is say, well, there are certain uh, forms of disputes which are better resolved on that international plane than within domestic legal systems. I think we have time for one more question and in the back. <coughs> Sorry, Gary, I wasn't sure whether you meant me when you said it. I didn't mean <laughs> Don't steal the microphone. Uh, Christopher Greenwood. Um, I'd like to follow up on both on the point that Campbell's just made and also on what Maurice Mendelssohn was saying, because uh, I, I think one of the things that is very striking looking at, at the different approaches of domestic courts to these issues today from the standpoint of one of the international courts is that if you go back to, the, say, the 70s, when certainly English courts, and I think the same would have been true of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, I'm not competent to speak about America, uh, were very reluctant to get involved in the sort of questions of foreign relations law. One of the factors that it seems to me might have had something to do with that is that they couldn't see any other courts doing it either. Mm -hmm. There was hardly any international jurisprudence at all. Now, the year I took my master's in international law, there was one case in the ICJ which the court decided it didn't have jurisdiction to hear. The 1977 volume of reports of the ICJ is four pages long, and that's two pages in English and two pages in French. <laughs> there was no system of ICSID arbitration. ICSID was there, but it wasn't doing anything. It hadn't been doing anything for a decade. There were hardly any interstate arbitrations taking place. There was no international criminal court. There were no international criminal tribunals. The European Court of Human Rights case law could be fitted into one volume. And I wonder whether it's partly the growth of an in a system of courts at the international level, which are dealing with questions of this kind, that has made courts in common law states feel more comfortable handling this sort of issue. Uh, they can see other judges doing it. Uh, I'd be very interested in the comments of both the speakers on that. Um, I, I think that's quite perceptive, Judge Greenwood, and I... Uh, uh, think that's quite right. I, I think in the U.S. it's complicated a bit because the U.S. judges are still looking, A, they're looking for points of entry for international law to come in, and secondly, they already have a lot of robust confidence about doing public law generally. They just don't call it international law. Uh, but uh, I, I, certainly there's been an impact in the growth of international jurisprudence, uh, of international juridical actors generally. 
I, I agree. I think the point perhaps does have a particular salience for the British and Commonwealth uh, courts, partly because of the uh, large-scale participation of those countries in international adjudicatory systems, um, because of submission to the jurisdiction of the international court through the optional protocol and also through the myriad of other in new international courts and tribunals, which has built a familiarity that wasn't there um, before. But of course, this issue also takes place against the background of a much wider movement, often called the international law and domestic courts movement. Um, and it is a very discernible uh, feature of modern life, perhaps coming from Professor Mendelssohn's general point about globalization, that domestic courts haven't been able uh, to shut their eyes to the obvious fact that we are living in an interdependent world where often international law provides the appropriate yardstick to determine uh, disputes, which isn't to say that the individual features of particular constitutions aren't still very important because the prism through which international law gets fed can, can, can still quite validly, I think, be different depending upon individual states. Uh, constitutional arrangements, that's why we organise ourselves, after all, through states as domestic polities. It, it raises as well, I think, fascinating questions about the transparency debate. Um, if, if, in fact, more decisions mean more law, um, because if they're decisions, their courts will discern law to be applied, um, it casts the transparency debate in investment arbitration and elsewhere in, in a somewhat different light. That different light, though, we'll have to examine on another occasion because we've run out of time for our two speakers. I'd like all of you to join me, please, in, in thanking the two of them for what I think is a <laughs> tremendous presentation. I'm going to run oh, yeah. no, right I now. It. I get it. It's great. great to meet yes. you. Yes, absolutely. I think they're drinks somewhere, but I'm not <laughs> sure where. <laughs>